the right side of the body is the sun the left side of the body is the moon both of those working in harmony weaving back and forth create something synergetic something greater which is that magnificent radiant beautiful walking star or living treasure that we all are to take that from the personal and take it to this culture in the United States you have that same energy at work as far as the decades are concerned. In the 40s, 1940s, and the 1950s, in this culture, we could say were accelerated sun times. Dynamic, assertive, technological energy, bringing high creative energy, active energy, bringing things into form, satellites the atom bomb, the spaceship. High active, dynamic sun energy for 20 years. Achievement was considered very important in this culture. In order to balance that kind of radiant, dynamic, assertive energy, then in the 60s and the 70s, this culture reached for the moon. You could see that the 60s and the 70s was a time of introspection, going inward, spiritual quests, a gamut of gurus that erupted, altered states, hallucinogens, and it is no accident that simultaneously at the time, if we want to think of Jung's synchronicity, that exactly in the same month and exactly in the same year when Einstein developed his theory uh, that led to the atom bomb, the evolution of the atom bomb, Simultaneously in Germany, Albert Hoffman discovered LSD. That you had on the outer, the atom bomb being the outer energy, the sun energy that could explode and erupt. Simultaneously you have an internal chemical showing us literally the explosive visions of the internal world at the same time and very few people realize that from a historical perspective. Accident, synchronicity, however you take a look at it. Higher design, purpose, so that you have in the 40s and 50s active sun times, the 60s and the 70s, whether it be altered states, whether it be going inward, exploring symbols, myths, where it be going into human potential, growth workshops, studying uh, extensively the meaning of life's purpose. That was the 60s and the 70s in this culture. Moon times, introspective, wanting to integrate, wanting to synthesize all the active sun times of the 40s and the 50s. So here we are at the beginning of the 80s. If the 40s and the 50s were sun times symbolically, with the 60s and the 70s being moon times, then what we have coming up in the 80s and the 90s are our walking star times. And perhaps what we're experiencing at this point in time literally is prenuptial anxiety. <laughs> that, we, that we have the 20 years of the sun merging with the 20 years of the moon culminating to create something completely new that has never been experienced before in 20 years in the 80s and the 90s, the age of synthesis, the age of integration, the age of bridging, that we have globally this being represented that the Western world could be considered the sun side of the planet, the Eastern world of this planet could be considered the moon side of the planet, that the sun has reached for the maiden with the rainbow, has reached for the maiden of the east, has reached for its intuition, its introspection, its philosophy, its religion. Simultaneously, the moon maiden has reached for the sun, the active, the creative, the dynamic, technological aspect, and we have that taking place, that kind of symbolic global um, bridging that's taking place at this point in time, which 
in the last five years, we have another bridging that is actively starting to take place, which is of the north and the south. We have the technological sun countries merging with the intuitive shamanistic countries of the Latin American curanderos, the uh, South American Amazon shamans, of the Aborigines, the Maoris, the Africans, that you will find a north-south bridging taking place uh, probably in the 80s and 90s. So it is no wonder at this point in time that we have El Salvador uh, very much uh, a focus or a picture, much as Iran was um, in the east. So that symbolically and mythically, what we have just from one global myth that is shared by all cultures of the sun, moon, creating the star, to see how actively that is being um, portrayed on a cultural level as well as a global level. The other myth that I'd like to, to share that goes into the seven stages is the one of the seven-headed dragon. Um, in some cultures, it's the seven-headed snake, it's the seven-headed dragon, it's the seven-headed lion, it's the seven-headed dog, it's the seven-headed male, it's the seven-headed female, but what's predominant is seven heads, and the seven heads are all associated with transition and change. Globally, all cultures identify three major transitions, and they have rituals associated with those three major transitions. There are rituals for birth, and there are symbols for birth. The, the, mo the wide, widest cross-cultural symbol of birth are two symbols, which happen to be the stork, which is a symbol of emergence, carrying something new, whether it be a baby, whether if you dream about storks, uh, it's something emerging on either the mental level, if the stork is flying, if the stork is in water, it's the emotional. If the stork is in the desert, it's perceptual, um, that somehow the vision is changing or the belief system is changing. If the stork is actively on the ground, there's a change being emerging within the physical body um, itself. Now, the other symbol for birth that's widely shared by all cultures is the snake shedding its skin. It's simultaneously death, rebirth. The snake is a cross-cultural symbol of transformation and of transition. The emergence, literally, of the snake emerging and letting go of its new head is a symbol of birth, and the old head being wiggled off, literally, the old skin. And if you've ever watched, and I, I would recommend it, either going to a zoo or whatever, but during the time that snakes shed their skin, to watch the process would give you a great appreciation of how hard it is to shed an old pattern, <laughs> or an old attitude, or an old belief system, because uh, it takes great effort, it takes great struggle, and yet the beautiful thing of all snakes is that they never look back at what they've discarded. And there's a lesson to that. They always, the head totally moves forward and the skin is totally dropped. There's no attachment to the snake, uh, the old garment. Um, so here we have a cross-cultural symbol of the snake that is both death, rebirth. The stork, however, does not play a part in the death cross-culturally. It is primarily a birth symbol. The second ritual that is shared by all humankind where you have actual celebration, you have actual ritual uh, created by uh, all cultures is marriage or uh, emergence. The primary symbol cross-culturally is the circle or the ring. I say circle, some cultures do not use the ring but they will use reeds, which is, again, the circular formation of banding 
the two consciousness together, the double wreaths often um, serve that purpose. You'll find that in cultures you will find different rings, different qualities of rings. Uh, again, the finger placement is different in cultures, but the ring is somehow exchanged in 60% of your cultures, not any higher percentage uh, on that as a symbol of bonding. Also, the second symbol that's most cross-culturally shared for merchants is the knot, the knot. And I think it's, it's incredibly interesting to see all the different kinds of knots, but primarily what is shared is that a knot always involves bringing two loops together in some way. It's the joining of two. <coughs> How you join the knot together is a symbol, literally, of what, of commitment. It's also a symbol of, of how uh, those two people are bond or how important it is for them to stay bond, whether it's in ribbons, whether it's in ropes, uh, whether it's in yarn, whether it's in weavings, but, uh, but the knot and the colors um, that are used with that. But mergents and especially the bow, and being able to untie the knot or to make sure that the bow is secure uh, is significant. You find in your Eastern cultures that um, the couple will stand between two trees, which is being at the gates, at the portals. There will be a rope that is tied around the two trees, knotted on each side, and they will stand underneath the knot between the two trees, which is like a double symbolic ceremony of the passage going through the portals and somehow sharing the same kind of pattern, the labyrinth, the knot, the maze way, uh, the connection, what they're going to be working out uh, together in that state of emergence or commitment. Okay, we have death as the third most common uh, transition or transformation that is shared globally, birth, emergence and death. Death, cross-culturally, is not symbolized by skulls and crossbones majority of the time. We have only 40% of our cultures on the globe that use the symbol of the bones. The bones in the body are associated with the element of earth, <coughs> whereas you have the blood and the waters uh, associated uh, with water you have the breath and the heat or the temperature in the body associated with fire. And you also have the lungs or the breath associated with air uh, within the body as well, and particularly the brain. So that you have uh, with, um, I just went that way <laughs> on the brain the brain does it every time <laughs> um, it was tied to what I was saying before uh, it's on death oh and bones that's where death bones and the brain did it to me all right um, so that that we have that the bones within the body are the skeleton structure and without the skeleton structure, we could not move. We would literally be organs, skin, blood on the floor with no structure. And bones give us structure. And so globally, you have bones and the cross, the cross bones. The cross being cross-culturally the symbol of turning points, crossroads, transition. That is the one thing that is shared cross-culturally, that the cross is either a symbol, the X cross is a symbol of protection, it's a symbol of turning points cross-culturally, it's a symbol of warning cross-culturally, and cross-culturally it's a symbol of transition. It's the crossing. It literally is the cross crossing or the bridge. So that you have very strongly, 60% of your cultures will use the cross the X as a symbol of death, being X'd out, making the final crossing. Uh, oftentimes, the head is put in the middle of that, whether it be shrunken heads, 
whether it be the skull, whether it be a picture of someone, and that picture is veiled in any way um, by certain cultures. Among the Maoris, you have literally their heads which shrink, and then it's, it's veiled as a symbol that they've made the passage they have crossed over, which is uh, a symbol of death. Different cultures, black is not a predominant color for death or returning to the, the void cross-culturally. You have a mixture between black, white, and red as being the predominant colors for that. Um, spiritually, the color predominantly associated with death is yellow, returning to the light, returning to the non-formless form. So of those three passages, birth, marriage, and death, you have predominant symbols. The Asian symbol that is associated with death, rebirth, and particularly with that final stage of death and crossing over is the phoenix. That the phoenix shared by China and ancient Egypt literally is the bird that flies to the desert and collects twigs until uh, there is enough uh, to make a nest and then the bird will, will sit in the nest and flap its wings harder and harder until the twigs catch on fire and then the phoenix is on fire and as the feathers move upward they transform into small baby birds which is a symbol of death, rebirth, the final uh, passage. The same other cross-cultural symbols that are joined with birth and death, and not so much with marriage, but we've talked about the snake and we've talked about the phoenix. Several others are cross-cultural, transformative, death, rebirth, or transformative symbols. And one definitely is the lotus blossom, moving out of the mud, the leaded, heavy consciousness into more of the illuminated, aware, consciousness, all the new aspects of the self, bejeweled, the many petaled lotus blossom. The same is also true of the ugly duckling into the beautiful swan, moving out of the darkened aspects, the unexplored aspects of ourselves, the ugly duckling into uh, the radiant swan. Same with the lantern, the lantern, the symbol of the physical body, that is touched in such a way that it returns to its higher self or the genie self, tapping the genie that's within, moving, uh, joining the physical with the higher self. Uh, so you have that cross-cultural myth shared by many. Another very transformative myth, but one that is also includes a bridging principle or the principle of mergence which I think that in the 80s and 90s, we're gonna to need to look at myths that are not polarized in any way. Right now, we have cross-culturally, we have many myths that are associated with salvation, associated with Messiah uh, myths, the last, uh, the last coming. Uh, we have other myths that are doomsday, destruction, um, apocalypse, um, Agamemnon, I think that's it. Yeah, right. So that you have the salvation destruction coming up very str uh, strongly, and a lot of myths globally to support each one of those in equal power. That is also true in personal change, social, social change, or cultural change, or global change, that when we are in change, those symbols or myths will surface with equal power, that we will be very excited that things are going to work out, be very optimistic, or we'll be very pessimistic, they're not going to work out. That's the salvation, destruction, uh, polarity at work. And taking a look at that, I found that there were equal number of salvation myths globally as there were destruction myths, and then I thought, well, if they're equal number in the polarity, where are the bridging myths? Where are the bridging symbols that we could focus on that would transform us getting stuck in one polarity or the other that we could focus on those bridging myths? 
And I found that cross-culturally there is one myth in particular that all cultures have a variation of that is definitely a bridging myth, and that is Pandora's box. Now we have Pandora, who was created by all the gods and the goddesses, all the beautiful qualities, gifts, and talents of all the gods and the goddesses, and yet she unleashed all the ills, the evils, into the world. So you have your salvation, destruction, and yet overlooked, which we're doing simultaneously at this point in time, but in existence, overlooked but still in existence, was one thing that did not come out of Pandora's box. And that was the last key, which was hope. Hope. It was overlooked, still left at the bottom of, trans, uh, of Pandora's box. So then I started taking a look at this in our modern day myths, and I thought about Star Wars. We have the salvation, Luke Skywalker is our salvation hero. Then we have Darth Vader, who is our doom destruction. And who is the bridging character? That is often overlooked, but a strong key, but Yoda the bridging character between the two is Yoda. And I think that what's going to be exciting, as I've shared with you about the sun-moon times of the 80s and the 90s, that in an age of synthesis and integration, we need to look predominantly at what are the bridging symbols and what are the bridging myths. And I find that it's very interesting that in the age of the 80s and the 90s that perhaps the most natural bridging symbol that we may also have overlooked or taken for granted is nature's rainbow. That bridging the sky with earth, which is also bridging the spirit with matter, is also bridging what's within, without, or as above, so below, and perhaps by accident or synchronistic uh, association is that the stickers that you see so predominantly on so many cars, so many t-shirts of the rainbow, might be a subconscious realization that indeed that's what we're doing at this point in time. is bridging between the sun times, the moon times, bridging between what's within and out as above and so below. Okay, am I going? Are you on OD yet? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll, qu any questions uh, before I go through the seven um, cross-cultural stages of transformation? Okay, I've identified three major stages, which are birth, marriage, and death. And it's interesting to me that in this culture, which is the forerunner and the main culture that has one thing in common that it also overlooks, and it's the only constant. When I look at cultures, I look at what they don't write about, because that's what they're experiencing. That's what they're experiencing the most. This culture, I looked at what is very seldom not written about, but what is experienced the most, and I found that change, transition, rite of passage has been very, has almost been eliminated from written literature. The first book written in English in this culture on change or rite of passage was Van Gedup's book called Rite of Passage. It's very interesting to me that it was only in the 70s and in the late 70s and the early 80s that we had three books come out identifying transformation, transition, or how to handle change. Three major books. One was Roger Gould's book on transformation, which was the forerunner and which is involved in a lawsuit right now with Gail Sheehy's passages because um, apparently she had lifted much of his work uh, before it was published, supposedly. Um, 
And Bill Bridges, is, and I think it's interesting, William Bridges' uh, <laughs> book published this year called Transitions is the only book in English that identifies the process of transition and transformation. And he articulately states that in any change, any transition, whether it's symbolically or mythologically represented, that it involves a three-stage process, which goes along with the birth, marriage, death uh, that I was talking about earlier. Every transition involves an ending. Every person who has, is in transition, if something has been completed, ended, whether it be a relationship, whether it be a project, whether um, it be something that day that you X'd off a list, anything that has ended puts us in a state of transition. So all transitions uh, involve an ending. Every ending <coughs> takes us into what he calls a, a neutral zone or a period of assimilation of what we've just ended or experienced. And usually in that neutral zone is new beginnings. So we have endings, the neutral zone as he identifies it, and beginnings. What would be the symbols that are associated with ending probably are many of the death symbols. What are the symbols that are associated with the neutral zone would be the bridging symbols, whether it's the bridge, whether it's the portals, whether it's the gateways. Any new beginnings would be the cocoon stage, would be the seed, uh, would be the stork, would be any symbol regarding emergence. And then the cycle begins again. The Asian or the Oriental cultures identify that change is the only constant. <coughs> it's usually the Western cultures that identifies change as equaling the end. And so that you have a difference of perspective there, one where change is identified that it is a cycle, it is a constant, and something that you can always count on happening, that we're all in change, then there is more ease with that belief system. If there is a, a strong belief system that change equals the end, there is threat, there can be resistance, and there can be fear. And so that they have the symbol in, of the Ouroboros snake in the Oriental cultures, which is the snake eating its own tail as a reminder that everything is a cycle everything is in process, that there is no definitive end, neutral zone, or beginning. But a Western culture would see that there would have to be a definite end, neutral zone, or beginning. And yet Western cultures are at a point where change is happening so fast that they are having trouble with process. They're wanting things to be instantaneous and moving more towards change being a cycle rather than change being a process, which it was before. And that's going to take new symbols and new adjustments. Probably the most well-known symbol of transformation is the butterfly. And what does the caterpillar know about the butterfly? Uh, when, I am a, when I am a caterpillar crawling on the ground, will I ever know that I'll be a butterfly? When I'm a butterfly, do I realize that I've been on the ground as a, as a caterpillar? Now, that transformation from cocoon, which is womb-like seeding, to elongation, crawling, exploring, to reaching new heights and new mastery and new perspective is a process that we're all involved in continually. Biologically, the body is involved in that process every seven years. That all the cells in the body biologically completely change. And what would be incredible for you to do is to collect pictures of yourself when you were seven years old, when you were 14 years old, when you were 21 years old, when you were 28 years old, 
35 years old, 42 years old, and so on, that you will find that indeed, <coughs> much like McLuhan's theory that the change took place first in consciousness, it was acted out in behavior, but you can actually see it in the physical structures. And to take a look at how you have transformed every seven years physically. And what would be equally interesting for you to do is <coughs> have either clients or students or patients do sometime is literally to have them make a nautilus graph, a seashell nautilus graph of every seven years taking a picture and also identifying what were the changes that were experienced at that point in time or within those seven years that led to that transformation. What were their symbols, what were the symbols that were particularly important to you as a seven-year-old, 14-year-old, 21-year-old, or 28-year-old, and so on. And there are some important discoveries uh, in all that and incredible connections and um, hidden patterns that are suddenly um, revealed. Oh. <laughs> All right. Besides the sun moon story, there is another story that is shared by all humankind about a male or a female figure. And it varies in culture, but it'll be either male or female figure. But a male female figure who had black hair and would walk with a panther by their side, searching for themselves. And gradually, as they began to discover who they were, the hair started to turn brown, and the panther changed to a leopard. And as they began to fully realize who they were, the hair turned fiery red, and as they began to manifest who they were, the leopard began to transform into a beautiful lion to match the self-realization. But the individual placed these two fingers on the growth marks of the leopard and prevented the transformation to take place as a, so that the person could have a reminder of the dark places from where they come, which were the spots on the leopard. Now that is a cross-cultural myth, and we have the closest resemblance of that in this, this culture is Black Sambo. Black Sambo is, a, is this culture's transformation myth that's very similar to other transformation uh, myths in other countries about self-realization and self-discovery and self-transformation. And uh, so besides the sun-moon myth, you have very much this transformative myth. It is the animal instinctual nature that is transforming as much as the persona or the spiritual nature is transforming, all three happening simultaneously uh, at the same time. Okay. I think I, I'd like to leave you with those <coughs> thoughts to stimulate you and uh, maybe entertain some questions at this point in time, and then take these further uh, tomorrow morning. <coughs> Any questions, thoughts, sharings, wonderings, imaginings? Yes. Do you feel that there have been 20 year cycles on past uh, the past century or so, or are you just hypothesizing that? I think they have been before. I, have, I think they involve different symbols. I think the 40s and the 50s have definitely been associated with the sun. And I see the 60s and 70s very moon. And I see the 80s and 90s very star. I think um, I have a couple of students who are taking a look at the other decades in this, this culture and seeing what would be the particular transformations, if there is like a 10-year 10, 10 cycle, but we definitely have a 20-year cycle uh, from the 40s to the 80s uh, that tie in with, with the symbol. 
I'm asking about prior to 1940 to 1850 or 1870. 1770. Uh, have you seen the pattern? Yes. Yes, I have. What I've done is um, I've been very much interested in the principle of esoteric, exoteric. That I found that um, what would be the esoteric discipline of physics. And I started looking at that and I thought, well, that's alchemy. What would be the esoteric discipline of astronomy? And I found that was astrology. What is the esoteric discipline of mathematics? And found that was numerology. What was the esoteric discipline of science? And I found that was symbols. So I thought, well, if there's that esoteric, exoteric principle going on in the disciplines, then it's also probably going on in the decades, and it's also going on probably in our own personal growth and development. And so, um, yes, I'd have to answer you yes on that. Okay, any other questions or wonderings? Just thinking. <laughs> Someone said, <laughs> yes. I must say I am intrigued when you talk about this thing of transition. And I think back of that wonderful cry you told us of with your uh, lecture on the Basque. Right. For the uh, cry of birth and the cry uh, of death. Right, the cry of the spirit. Death reapers. Uh, Cross-culturally what's shared by all humankind is, is mantras, uh, is sound. Um, sound, music, art, language, economic systems, um, governance, rules of government, governance, and we have that sound is cross-culturally considered along with light and along with uh, love and along with environments as strong healing components in every culture and that you have sound very much associated with death rebirth processes and you have mantra systems and music uh, music that enhance uh, higher frequencies of experience joy ecstasy delight other music uh, that that create moods and you find that in the bass culture <coughs> the sound um, is extremely important that the name is of every individual is given careful consideration uh, before they're born. Uh, they're not named until they're seven years old in the Basque culture, uh, primarily um, because you have uh, the family witnessing the quality and the char character of this individual. And so that it's at the time that the baby's head is beginning to crown that the cry of the spirit is given. It's also at weddings, the cry of the Spirit is given. It's also at deaths that the cry of the Spirit is given. And the birth cry is very different from the death cry. Uh, the birth cry is very powerful. It is the cry of the Spirit of the sun and the moon being unified by the rainbow tongue that the right side of the body, the sun side of the body, the golden side of the body is unified with the left side of the body, the silver moon side of the body and that the cry of the spirit comes through the central vertical axis of the body to unify the sun moon within or the male female within or the yin yang within or the shiva shakti um, within and it, in the bass culture that sound of the spirit is called the arinsi and it goes like this to bring the spirit to the body, that kind of energy is required. But at the same time, when we're making the ultimate passage, which I talked about earlier, the ultimate bridge from this world to the next, or the ultimate transition, every transition that we go through in this lifetime is a prep preparation for the ultimate transition um, to the other side. And in the Basque culture, that sound 
is very different. You see it, you'll hear it as a sound of letting go of each head mentally, emotionally, perceptually, and physically. And it goes like this. to take a look at the seven passages that are globally shared that every culture has what's called a point of entry and the symbol for that usually is the gates as I come through the door all I'm doing is entering I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to participate or not I've just entered and you'll see this people will check their bearings and find out where their spot is now once they're looking for their spot we've left entry. And the second stage globally shared by all people is birth. That birth really is the process of wanting to participate. Wanting to participate. Looking for the spot. The third stage shared by all cultures is initiation. That once I have been in my spot for a while, I get comfortable, I've mastered something, I've participated, I've I've been there for a while. That's, that's initiation, uh, cross-culturally. After I've been initiated, I'm comfortable, it's somewhat familiar. Then the next stage that's shared cross-culturally is the concept of commitment, which is mergence or marriage. And each of us might have difficulty at different stages and repeat patterns, the labyrinth, the maze way, uh, um, patterns of, of any kind. Uh, for example, some people might find it hard to enter, other people might find it hard to birth or to participate, stay in places for a while, other people might find it difficult to show any kind of mastery, which is initiation. Other people might be fine with entry, birth, initiation, and freak on commitment or emergence uh, or marriage, and always come to that stage and have uh, some difficulty with that. After commitment usually is demonstration, the ability to show that you can demonstrate what you've learned. Uh, it's the state of mastery. The initiate, the initiate is, is early mastery. It's, it's <coughs> indicating that you, you stayed in there uh, for a while. After mastery or demonstration, all cultures share a period that's called attainment. It's the period of having. It's the period of of, of harvest, it's a period of, of success. Um, and ultimately the final stage is release and uh, of the letting go and the cycle starts again. That same cycle can be applied to relationships, it can be uh, applied to the creative process, it can be applied to this evening's experience. We all entered the room, we went through the gates, through the portals, we found our spot, which was birthing. We got comfortable with the situation, listening to the meeting. And we were literally initiated. We went through the rite of initiation with flowers and presents and um, acknowledgement of people for uh, their participation, their level of birthing, their level of, uh, of having entered. And also their level of demons, uh, their level of commitment, which was mergence, their level of demonstration, the level of attainment, and once we go out through the portals, we'll be release or letting go, and the cycle starting with the new experience again. That's also the cycle that's applied to every conversation. Uh, so it's not we're going through that cycle all the time, and so conversations can be easy or difficult, but it would be interesting for you to track which of those seven are difficult. Entry, birth, initiation, mergence, demonstration, attainment, or, or release. Those are the seven uh, globally identified. And also it would be interesting for you who are working with clients or with students to see within 
the stories or the myths or the difficulties that they're sharing, what is the stage that they're having the most difficulty with? Do they have a hard time experiencing something new, which is birth? Do they have a hard time facing, uh, trying a new situation, which is opening the door, facing the unknown, which is entry? Uh, are they afraid to be acknowledged by other people? Initiation. Is there difficulty with commitment of any kind? Completion, which is emergence. Uh, fear of success, demonstration attainment um, is there difficulty with really receiving attainment or having is there difficulty letting go which is relief and symbols that are associated with those we'll go into more detail tomorrow all right other questions mm -hmm. is there um, historically buildings that represent the seven states more clearly than what we do that would be um, an interesting connection to make because buildings certainly are uh, structures of identity processes. And there has been no one that's put that together. And I, I would highly suggest that you demonstrate that. <laughs> that, would be really, that would be really beautiful to do a, a global uh, pictorial building structure because uh, in dreams so often we find ourselves in buildings or we find ourselves in rooms and uh, all of those are based on, on transitions too so please do that yes. yeah, I'm a friend of a friend of Jung uh -huh. and so uh, I remain kind of like just listening uh, and a lot of things you said were fascinating to me uh, as a scientist however I wonder whether you're discovering things in sevens, or you're coming with the number seven and putting things in sevens. Do you see what it's, I mean? It's the former, because when I started, I wasn't numerologically oriented, looking for sevens. Um, I was amazed. I thought, when I went into it with the hypos hypothesis, that I would find more fours. Um, I was more four-oriented, and I was really frustrated to find that there was not enough data for four. And then here came the seven uh, popping up all the time. Shared amazingly amount, an incredible resources called the Motif Index, uh, which is a cross-cultural um, study of all, all mythological uh, themes, subjects, heroes, uh, myths, and so on. And in that, uh, they have a numerological category of ones, twos, threes, and fours, and so on. But under sevens, not nearly as much of what I found in other themes. And I was particularly looking for the four, because I was extremely partial to that. So uh, I was surprised by the seven, and later delighted. Thank you. Is the seven-day week ubiquitous in cultures? Seven-day week is not. Uh, you'll find that 85% um, almost, almost, but you'll find in your oceanic <coughs> cultures, you also find in the Basque culture you have a three-day week, and also in the oceanic cultures it's, it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And the other days of the, of the week in the Basque culture are associated with the days of the night. They're called the evenings of the night. Uh, they're not associated with weeks. It's like exploring the unknown. Uh, in your oceanic cultures, those other days or nights are associated very strongly with that which is to be discovered as the future. It's like film that's waiting to be exposed. Um, it's the best analogy I could give to that. But seven is incredible what I've uh, come across because you have the seven colors of the rainbow. Um, you have um, the seven days of the week. Uh, very strongly, although four becomes very strong, but uh, there are others uh, with the seven uh, that don't meet. Seven openings in the face? Yeah, the seven openings in the face, very much so. Uh, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes? Do you have any personal uh, opinions about the 80-90 synthesis or transcendence? 
would it have anything to do with Aquarius? Um, there are, are philosophical and theoretical uh, thinkings that uh, we're coming into the age of Aquarius, leaving the age of Pisces. My personal um, belief system is that we're coming into a period where things will be destructured, which is literally the meaning of the word destruction. And yet in the Western uh, culture, that's seen as, again, uh, fearful or negative, yet in the Eastern cultures, it's, it's seen to destructure, does not mean bad, evil, uh, violent. It means literally to destructure something so that it allows for space for something to be constructed or restructed uh, or restructured. And so that I find that probably what will happen in the age of synthesis and integration or build, uh, bridging is that a lot of people <coughs> sense that there will be changing times and again the doomsday destruction myths come to the fore and then we have the optimistic uh, things are going to work out all right um, uh, myths come to the fore and yet we need the bridging myths uh, to create something that to hold our attention beyond the polarity and uh, to look for those. I don't see it as that violent of a time, but if there's enough energy that would be put to fear behind destructuring and fear behind change, then thought directs energy and energy follows thought. And so um, for the 80s and 90s, somehow uh, utilizing the adage that if, uh, which is an old Asian uh, motto, and also among the Basque people, they have the, the premise that the wise man who goes to the top of the mountain and just thinks positive thoughts is not going to create a, an event. But a wise man that goes to the top of the mountain and thinks positive thoughts and then comes down and does something with that thought is going to create a positive event. That's the positive thought with the action that leads to the event. The wise man who, who works and toils at the top of the mountain and thinks no positive thoughts is not going to create a positive event. It's taking the combination um, of the two. So, again, look for the symbols that would uplift the times. Along that line, I thank you because I, I'm a mother of a couple of small children. And you're talking about the rainbow, which has helped me because they draw rainbows from the day they can pick up their crayons uh -huh. and draw rainbows. And I'm so tired of a rainbow. rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on my refrigerator. There's a rainbow. Like sometimes there's rain and suns and moons and stars, but always there's rainbow. So you've helped me with that to see that that's uh, unconsciously, perhaps. Uh, right. they, build, they build houses, you know, structuring things up a lot, too. Right. I understood that, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm good feeling about all those rainbows. <laughs> really? Oh, it's wonderful. The rainbow is an incredible symbol um, for that. So enjoy it, because <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, they're in transition, and they're integrating and bridging things within themselves. And I find that children a lot, especially uh, youngsters, will draw rainbows a lot uh, more frequently when they feel themselves in transition, so that they can make that connection. Rainbows are connecting symbols. So there's something that they're connecting. Okay. Yes. One last thing on the rainbow. You know, I can't recall the seven colors. Could you remind me of them, please? Uh, I'll try. Uh, we have blue, green, red, yellow, blue, green, red, yellow, orange, indigo, Violet, purple. Violet, you got the wrong order. Yeah. <laughs> wrong order, but the colors. <laughs> Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Ah, it's a painter for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Was the symbol of a ring divided into three bands by each side with an interlocking B in the middle and B like the sign of a specific merger? Yes, yes. Anything that's that elaborate indicates there's going to be a specific kind of emergence or commitment. Does that interlocking B, B, can you 
tell me what that might be or you mean it. Okay, you have what, three rings? It's, it's one band and there are two lines around which would make it appear to be three rings in one, but it's just, it's just in the design. Okay. And then in the middle one comes a V this way and then interlocking a V this way. Okay, the, the V's coming together that you have in ancient Egypt, not that horizontally, but vertically, when you had two V's coming together, that was a very strong symbol that the upright pyramid was dynamic, assertive, sun energy. The downright pyramid was magnetic, moon energy coming together. That was their sigil or seal of protection, protecting the upright assertive energy with the downright magnetic energy protecting that. And it uh, was seen as a symbol of creative power. If you bring those together, it creates a star. That if you bring the two Vs together, it would create a star. If you turn the Vs around, you're going to have the diamond, where the backs of the pyramids come together, and you have the upright and the diamond. In ancient Egypt, that was uh, a symbol of creative power, that the two coming together created a greater whole, which is the star, and also the diamond. And so that the fact that you come together this way horizontally, that there is something externally, because horizontal, anything horizontal is, is seen as external. The vertical is internal, so there is a horizontal commitment, there's an outer commitment. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes, Transformations by Roger Gould. The um, second one was Passages by Gail Sheehy. And the third was Transitions by William Bridges. And then you mentioned something else at the very beginning. 1929 Van Gettup's book Van Gettup's. called Rites of Passage. Now, a culture that <laughs> has transformed and changed more than any other culture, I think it's significant that there have only been four major works on the subject of change and transition uh, in the early 1920s and then, of course, in the 70s and the 80s. And so the field is wide open for your book on structures. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I guess it's a quarter of 10. Quarter of 11. Oh, quarter of 11. Oh, because the time moves, it moves ahead. I thank you very much for your attention this evening. And for those who are interested, we will go into more of an experiential um, and in-depth exploration tomorrow on Symbols of Transformation. Thank you.